Hi and welcome. I'm excited for you to be here at this master class. This video is about giving you insight into what you're about to step into. Now, as far as I can tell, this level of fit health and wellness program is unlike anything that's currently out there because of what it's currently weaving in. Now, one of the greatest challenges is for me to give you insight into this program so that it can answer a lot of your questions right here, right now, and so that you have a clear clear idea of what you're going to be getting yourself into. Now, there are some challenges associated with this program. A lot of people aren't ready to dive deep into things like programming and things like trauma, but let's get to it and give you a little bit of insight into what that is. Before I get into that, <clears throat> if this is your first contact with me, you have no idea who I am. Maybe you got a little bit inside. Maybe you found me on social media through Nomads with a Purpose. Maybe you found me through my Instagram. Maybe you found me through my YouTube. I'm Coach Victor Robledo, and I've been working as a strength and conditioning coach, a health and wellness coach, a wellness um, coach for almost 30 years. Now, I started off working as a trainer at 19, and what I was doing then and what I'm doing now almost completely pales in comparison. But much like fitness, I've stacked bricks to build health and wellness. You need to build a brick wall. You need to build it up and stack bricks to build your health and wellness. And I have also done that in my health and wellness coaching. I gradually, okay, I'm going to build up strength and conditioning programs. I'm going to build up um, physical therapy to prevent injury. I'm going to build um, strength and flexibility work to prevent those injuries. And so over the last 30 years, I've consistently built up to the point that I'm building a wall and building a program that's very, very diverse. So I started off working out when I was in middle school, got my first weight training program. And I've gone through an evolution of running my own programs, first off starting in a commercial gym, but then working my own gym and really testing lots of different things and really getting to know certain people to the point that I was working with people 20 and 30 years. I have some clients that I'm working almost 30 years. And what is unique about that, and I've seen their highs and lows and I've needed to learn to adjust my program and learn more myself, not only going through my own health and wellness challenges as well, like having a family, realistically looking at my program, wanting to achieve goals, having my own health issues. There was a time in my mid thirties where I had a significant bout of adrenal fatigue and I was just trying to get through the day. And the normal medical industry, the medical industrial complex did not come up with any answers. They wanted to simply give me medication when I knew, wait, this is there's something else going on. I need to scratch at the surface, figure out even more, and then apply that to help my clients even more. And then jumping into on my full RV lifestyle, you know, I live full time, I full time travel RV with my family. And we've done that for almost now seven years. Now to the point that we're sort of a gypsy caravan, we travel in two RVs. And it sounds like I was living my dream, but there was this massive conflict and programming issue that I was encountering that still wasn't letting me thrive. And so in the process of learning all that, I developed even more of a program. And in the process of growth with my family, constantly searching more and more and more and figuring out what is health and well wellness, I discovered a whole new program. And so that's what I'm about to think. Uh, take you through and show you what the program is. So this program is about, let's first start off with my roots. We talked a little bit about me being a strength and conditioning coach and also having a ton of background as a sort of a physical therapy. As I started into my upper division courses, I realized like, man, I, I could really set myself aside by being, by really pulling into physical therapy. So I was on my path to to becoming a physical therapist, got into a clinical setting, realized like, oh, this isn't for me, but I continued my education. And to this day, it's still the nuts and bolts. I can look at someone and go like, oh, this is where your injury is. So we first off integrate some strength and conditioning. We want to be a strong individual, but that doesn't take being in the gym every day. As a matter of fact, most of my clients are spending 15, 20 minutes doing their strength training part of their workouts two to three times a week. And then my, uh, they're usually integrating 
a physical therapy, their injury prevention, 10 to 15 minutes, and you're using that as part of their warm up. How do you know what you need to work on? Well, that usually is established during the consult. You have previous injuries or a predisposition, aches or pains. We weave that into a program so that you're looking at weight training um, and doing your physical therapy or prehab, called rehab and prehab, for about 30 to 45 minutes, three times a week. Now, there are some people that I work on in a higher level. I have many levels to my coaching program that are seeing me daily and I take them through those things daily. But if you're on a program where you're doing it on your own, that's what you can look forward to. It does not take more. Now, if you have goals and aspirations of standing on a stage as a fitness competitor or a competitive bodybuilder, or you have high level goals with it when it comes to sports performance, then you will be in the gym likely more to make those things happen. Now, depending on the sport, if you're a runner, likely that you will not be spending more time in the gym. You'll be spending more time doing your prospective sport. Depends on the sport. So when it comes to working out, we all, I'm always talking about minimum effective dose. Doing just enough to get the result we're looking for. The vast majority of my clients want to get strong, want to build some strength, want to look great, and want to drop body fat. Well, that doesn't mean you need to spend hours and hours weight training in the weight training in a gym or in your home gym. You just need to spend enough time to flip that trigger, trigger to get your endocrinology right. Endocrinology, what does that mean? Get your hormones right. Now, after establishing and getting an understanding of what your stress level is, I can figure out what your body can tolerate. So let me back up. When we have significant amounts of stress, we're putting out high levels of cortisol. Cortisol is a stress hormone in our body. Now the problem with cortisol and um, having high levels is that we usually have an inversion. And that's the simplest way to understand this. If you have high levels of stress, either perceived or actual, and we'll get into that a little bit later in this, in this masterclass, you have high levels of perceived or actual stress, you will have high levels of cortisol. Cortisol is a fat storing hormone. And so the last thing you often need is a very intense workout. So you're gonna get workouts that are curtailed and created to get the result you're looking for. And so harder doesn't make something better. Better makes something better. So getting results, the proof is in the pudding. We always look in a week, two, are you feeling stronger? Are your numbers going up? Are you feeling more energetic? That's how we know your endocrinology is going right. Are you sleeping better? That's one of those big indications. If you're having a high level of cortisol and you go to bed, you can't sleep right. And so if you have high levels of stress, you have to create the right workout to create the balance. And that comes in also with the mindfulness section, which we'll get into, as well as your nutrition and, um, and journaling. So minimum effective dose is critical. And the physical therapy is quite straightforward. Uh, we, we pull from traditional and non-traditional to help heal uh, injuries and make sure that they don't happen. Now this leads me into my next section. So we talked a little bit about, yes, you will be doing some lifting. Yes, we will be doing some injury rehab and prehab. The next section is breath work. 100% um, of the people I work with do breath work. Now, what does that look like for each person? It can vary from five to 10 minutes daily. But going back, why breath work? Well, a lot of people I work with are new to meditation. Um, and so breath work gives us an ability to disconnect mind and body. Now, Nine out of 10 people I work with when they first start seeing me have some level of breathing dysfunction. What is breathing dysfunction? All right. So as I'm talking to you here, I'm super hyper because I want so excited about the program that I'm creating. I'm doing a fair amount of shoulder breathing. Now, shoulder breathing is a fight or flight breathing pattern. And so when we're finish a run or finish a workout, we're excited like what we're doing right now. We're doing a fair amount of this kind of breathing. Now that kind of breathing is related to a sympathetic, the sympathetic nervous system, which is fight or flight. Now being in fight or flight in a short term when we're exercising, not a problem. But I find that with evaluation, a lot of people are breathing on some level in that way the entirety of their day. Now in just a few minutes ago, we talked a little bit about stress hormones. It's particularly cortisol. And when you are in fight or flight, you are putting on off, putting off a high level of cortisol. And 
not only are you creating a sympathetic system, but you're going to start impacting how the brain works. And so we have two levels of in our nervous system that we want to be able to identify. Sympathetic and parasympathetic. Parasympathetic is generally aligned with rest and restore and sympathetic with fight or flight. And we want to create a harmony. We want to spend the vast majority of our, of our day when we're working even in that rest or restore. We don't need to be in that fight or flight. Now, if your job keeps you in that, you need to take an active role in shifting out of that because you cannot live in that sympathetic system. The digestion, your digestion will really get extremely bad because it starts to impact how the body can digest food. If you're running from a bear, you cannot digest your food properly. As a matter of fact, you're sending a signal to your body. It's not time to digest, it's time to flee or to fight if that's why we call it a fight or flight. The fight or flight or freeze. And so it's really, really important that we learn to shift ourselves into that parasympathetic system so that we can have health. Going back to that sympathetic chronic system and the impact that it can have, it can actually have detrimental impacts to your digestion, leading to leaky gut where we have food particles passing into the bloodstream and impact, impacting your susceptibility to food allergies, food intolerances, just an unhappy gut. And if you have an unhappy gut, you have an unhappy brain, right? And so the connection is as food particles pass through the bloodstream, the bloodstream is pumping through the whole body. It's also passing into the blood brain barrier. And that's where brain fog and clarity of thought, moodiness, grumpiness, depression, and anxiety can start to rear their head because the body is in dis ease, right? All of a sudden, you're sending consistent messages to be in fight or flight, which on a short term don't need have any major problems, but long term starts to break down all body systems and you start sending negative messages to your organs as well. So if you're in fight or flight, you are literally sending messages through your vagus nerve, through all your major organs. So your vagus nerve connects to your hypothalamus, your hypothalamus talks to all your body organs. Your hypothalamus is the emotional center of the body. So if you're in fight or flight and constantly chronically worried, anxious, angry, um, feeling shame, you're going to start talking and down regulating all those organs. More on all this on other videos, but to get a, just want to give you a little sneak peek into the madness that is in this program. We want to take you out of that and breath work can do that. Breath work actively shifts you into that parasympathetic by a few different strategies that I use. Very simple and sets build you up into active breath work. Now, like with anything, like a push-up, everything takes practice. And what you'll find in the demos and the tutorials that I have, I do the best to demonstrate these movements. If you feel significant lightheadedness when you're doing the breath work, when you're doing breath work, adjust the intensity to suit your needs. And it's very normal to find one that works for you, that you like at first, but important to provide a variety of different breath work based on what you need to get you into that rest to restore or to untether some stored trauma. More on that a little bit later. Shifting from breath work now, we'll talk a little bit about meditation. Everyone I work with needs to have a meditative practice. Now guided meditations, which I generally provide, are a great starting point because it helps you get a little bit of focus and sit in silence. Most people struggle with meditation, myself included. Sitting in silence was very difficult. What starts to happen is all of these ping pong balls start bouncing around in your head and you start to feel anxious. You start to feel like I, I need to be doing something. It's very important to start to establish and get to layers. Our body and our mind are very busy on a outer layer with what's going on today. And if we sit long enough, we start getting into what's going on potentially next week. And if we sit even longer, we start to figure out who we are, right? Know thyself, a very popular, to coin a very popular quote, um, is very, very important. And sitting in silence is all about finding out what makes us tick and what's going on deeper and deeper into the subconscious. We have roughly 80 to 90,000 thoughts a day. And the vast majority of those, 99% of those, are happening subconsciously. So what you're thinking about is literally not 
It's something you aren't actually processing. And we're just trying to tap into that to figure out what that is. And that's some of the information that I'm sharing with you. I'm a massive fan of Dr. Joe Dispenza, and I'll be linked, quote, uh, sending you information potentially to help you learn a little bit more. So a long line with meditation and sitting in silence, you'll also potentially be doing uh, journaling and Qigong. And Qigong is a great, uh, it's sort of the grandparent of Tai Chi. And why I like to use it is because a lot of people struggle with sitting in silence. So think of Qigong as sort of standing movement meditation to help you tap into what's going on. Think about this. How many people have stress-related muscle tightness? Hmm. Well, 100% actually. I've never met anyone in the 30 years that I've worked with that hasn't had some kind of stress-related muscle tightness. A lot of people feel tension in their neck and shoulders, as well as their low back and their hips will tighten up, especially when stress increases. So very important to start to see the connection between your body. The body and mind are connected. And that's what this program is highly about, is weaving that in so that you know what you need or teach you what you need on any particular day. Intuition is something that we get disconnected from. When I go in to do a workout, I have a plan installed for me. Now, I've been working out for many, many decades, but I make small adjustments based on what my body's telling me. And you'll learn to do that too. And you'll learn to know like, you know what, today I need to do a little more breath work. I'm stressed at work. And it seems obvious when I say it, but very few people pay attention to the body thinking they can move in. Now, that's sometimes the challenges we face with building, building resilience. I can push through. But it's important to treat the body with nuance and subtlety and weave us there to get us there. And eventually you can build that resilience and know what the mind and body need. So Qigong is movement meditation and journaling. Now journaling is a big part of if everyone's program. Now what that looks like for every person is going to vary. Now why do we need to do that? Well once you sit there you're going to go whoa closing your eyes or doing your Qigong. You're going to realize like man there's a lot going on that I didn't know about and that's where you either take pen to paper um, make a note on your phone, make a note on your laptop, or a lot of people, especially if you're depending on the different programs that you're at, you're texting me or sending me an email with that to share that with me to hold you accountable. Another idea is that we might be doing it as a video, much much like what I'm doing right now. You do the video journal just so, you keep, just so you're getting those words out and go, hey, I'm thinking about my mom right now. Wow, I haven't thought about that. Maybe she passed away. Maybe, maybe you need to pick up the phone or maybe you need to share that with someone. <clears throat> so it's real important as we get into the mindfulness part of this program, you realize you gloss over it. And for many, many years, I glossed over that until I realized what was going on a little bit more beneath. It was important for me to extract so that I can achieve ultimate health. Now, as we work into the next one is getting to know yourself. And this is where we start to identify your program is going to help you identify what is going on beneath that. How do we do that? Well, for many, many years, I've integrated MBTI and Enneagram. Um, these days, I'm using Enneagram significantly to figure out and figure out what your core desires are. Now, testing for Enneagram can be extremely challenging. For a lot of people, it's something they just don't want to do. From day one, especially through an evaluative process, I'm trying to establish, not to put you in a box, but to figure out what makes you tick. Now, you might have an idea already on if you've done the Enneagram test or you've really done some self work, some self growth work to figure out, hmm, what's going to make me thrive? As opposed to what does everyone else want me to do? What is this world kind of pigeon held me? I'm like, okay, I'm supposed to have a home and a car and have this career and have this family. But for a lot of people, that just doesn't work. And it leaves them feeling unfulfilled. So the Enneagram test will help us have a little bit of direction and identify, okay, this is what's important to me. An example for me, as a two, I'm all about helping, helping. I'm the sort of the helper, and I get my, my real joy out of helping others. However, that can leave me feeling completely stretched and unfulfilled in what I need. So it's very important that I create boundaries and have that self-care, each one of those. So... Enneagram will help us to identify that. Now, another big part of that 
is identifying, identifying and understanding chakra points. Now, this is where we start to get to, I might lose you a little bit in this, and we have way more information later on on what that is and how to help weave that in. Chakra, chakra points are simply energy hubs in the body, right? And we are electrical beings, right? That's why if you stick your finger in a, in a socket, you're gonna get buzzed, right? And so when we start to think about the hubs in the body, and if you need more information on this, remember now the beautiful thing about all of this and when I talk about it is that science has caught up to identify these things. The work Dr. Joe Dispenza's work has really been able to like, they study where these hubs are and where they're blocked and when they're blocked, what it can lead to. And so we have all these energy hubs and it's important to understand where that energy can be stuck and where you have pinch points and it can lead to um, physical ailments as simple as like my knees hurting me now of course if you are skiing and twist your knee and you have an ACL injury that's where you hurt it but even these chronic things that are unexplainable or tightnesses in the body which we alluded to before mind and body tightnesses right everyone has them it could be simply a pinch point relating to those chakra or those energy points and so we'll be working on your guided meditation and your breath work to help you identify and help you flow that energy through you, right? Or chi, right? That's where chi gong comes from, energy. Um, and so there, it's all one and the same. Exercise in many ways is about moving that energy, right? Meditation is about moving that energy. As a matter of fact, those systems are one and the same and that's why minimum effective dose is important just to create that movement, right? And so when we talk about your, your Enneagram and our chakras and lastly, we talk about trauma and everyone hates to talk about that. And a couple simple points on that. The, how we deal with stress is somewhere established in our brain between the ages of five and about middle school, right? And so depending on how we developed, right? Our parent, no, no upbringing is absolutely perfect. And there, was, there, there are two ways to talk about trauma. We have big T trauma and little T trauma. Both can have a massive impact on how you develop. Personally, I have a significant amount of trauma in my upbringing as a significant sexual abuse that impacted how I saw the world and how I was wired. And I had to do a lot of self-growth, particularly in these last seven years, because technically I would never relax. Every time we moved, like, I felt like I was always on alert. I traveled through Europe and where it really reared its head, moving from town to town. There wasn't actually anything that actually happened negatively, but I was always looking out for it so highly that I sacrificed the enjoyment of that moment. And it created a lot of stress on my, on my relationship. And I didn't even know it was, I was running these programs until I did this self work, which included that my uh, breath work, meditation, and uh, journaling to kind of draw that out of me. And with the help of my wife, I was encouraged to really scratch at the surface. And so we get down in this program, you could see that it's like, okay, we're working out. We haven't even gotten to the eating and we haven't even gotten to cardiorespiratory exercise. Now we're, we've really delved into who you are and what pieces came up to develop you. And so yes, it's absolutely important. Each person needs to deal with that in some way, shape or form to help identify that and not to like necessarily wallow in it. What we're here to do is to be empowered to go, oh, you know, this thing happened. Oh, it's rearing its head here in this way. It's going to impact me. But you know what? I'm going to pull it out and kind of observe it and go, this is how we're going to deal with this so that it doesn't impact my absolute health, wellness, and enjoyment of life. Because in the end, you know, the goals that we're seeing is like, I want you to be happy and healthy and enjoy the life that you have. Okay? So we'll evaluate talk a little bit about trauma, deal with some inner child work, and we can impact that through specific breath work styles as we get into deeper and deeper into your program. Moving into nutrition, you know, they always say abs are built in the kitchen, and that's absolutely true. But one of the biggest things we're facing, and I alluded to this right now, is the highest level of food allergies and food intolerances that we ever seen. And a big part of that is that our food has been destroyed, our soil has been destroyed, um, the the food complex, food and, you know, big business, big, big uh, impacts on big farming, mono agriculture has really destroyed 
a specific part of our food. And so it's very important when we're talking about nutrition, I will initially identify what level of inflammation, what level of leaky gut, leaky brain, adrenal fatigue that you might be going through. And I might start tapering down what you're eating. Well, first off, you have to source everything. 100% of the people that I work with, you need to start caring about every single thing you're putting in your mouth. And I will take you completely away from processed foods. Why? Because look at the ingredients. Most of them aren't actually food and are having a real negative impact. And if you are having some symptoms of adrenal fatigue, some symptoms of leaky gut, some symptoms of depression and anxiety, it's highly likely being affected negatively by the food that's going in your body. And so just because it says healthy on the label does not make it healthy. We want to get to preparing and sourcing all of our food. What does that mean? Well, first off, you're eating um, an all whole foods diet. You're preparing all of your meals. You're rarely eating out because when you're eating out, you're probably not getting the best source food. You're getting the best, best profit margin for that restaurant. Now, if you're eating at a farm to table, that might make it make some exceptions. However, they're using oftentimes seed oils to prepare those foods. And those seed oils are really much better suited to lubricate engine parts than they are going in your body. And I've seen one study that talked a little bit about a single serving of that seed oil can have an impact or a ramification of up to six years on your body. No bueno, no good. So really, really important. So gluten and dairy are also big, big triggers for many, many people. Why? Because it, most of that gluten is treated with glyphosate and it's GMO. And glyphosate is a carcinogen. So if you are reacting to the your body is reacting negatively to foods, constantly bloated or gassy or brain fog or any of the symptoms we talked about, would likely use an elimination diet, like really narrow the most common allergens that we tend to see in the in the diet and limit what you're eating to um, more uh, fruits, vegetables, and uh, meats. And so that leads me into meats. We want to eat organic, pasture-raised, or wild uh, meats and that includes all of them is fat bad for you no if you're buying industrial meat yes that would that fat is bad for you is cholesterol bad for you I get that all the time no actually cholesterol is necessary for making your hormones what's bad for you is processed sugar seed oils and poorly sourced food that will create an inflammatory process in your body which will impact your brain and how you think so when we're talking about nutrition, we're talking about sourcing all of your food. And most of you will be logging what you're eating and being held accountable for that. So limiting completely sugars and orga organic fruits and vegetables of all kinds are amazing in your diet. And depending on the level of severity of your blood sugar management problems, i.e. Uh, adrenal fatigue, even fruit might be a no-no depending on the dysbiosis. Dysbiosis in your body has to do with a bad bacterial overgrowth. So most people that first start off with me have some overgrowth problem. How do you know that? Well, gassy and bloated. Now, if you're constantly feeling like distended, there's probably a likelihood that you have a dysbiosis. Is that 100% linked to your food? No, it actually could be also linked, we talked about, to those negative thought patterns associated with the hypothalamus, downregulating your GI tract because you're constantly worried. If you're constantly worried, it's going to create a negative impact on your GI health. And as it creates a negative impact on your GI health, the bad bugs in your gut are going to go, go into over, overgrowth. And they're going to send you a signal, send down sugar, because that's what they want to live off of. So it's all related and it's all connected. And it's all something that we work on. And that's why we get kind of extreme with an elimination diet to help your gut health. Once we help your gut health, then... We get your gut health in order, then we move on to diversifying and trying organics of all different types, including corn and, and wheat, depending on where the sourcing is. But it's real important to understand that we first want to kill those bad bugs, bad bugs, get those that dysbiosis in control, inoculate using fermented foods, good healthy sauerkraut, kimchi, uh, kombucha, for example, to get that the good bugs. Now that leads me into supplementation. Everyone's supplementation is going to vary um, based on what their current health is. But there are a few things like, especially as I just spoke about 
fermented foods. Very important to get that bad bacteria and that good bacteria, kill all the bad bacteria, get that, that good bacteria flourishing in your GI tract. As a matter of fact, that has a lot to do with our intuition in our brain, right? We call it like, oh, I have a gut feeling. Well, it's not a surprise if you don't have a good gut feeling. If your GI health is off, how are you going to have a gut feeling? There's a reason we talk about that that way. And so real important. So often people are talking about probiotics with me. And I'd much rather always get at food source, but we'll weave in certain, certain supplements to get those things working for you. And so probiotics are one of them. Uh, sometimes we use a green supplementation, sometimes a multivitamin, sometimes certain things to help sleep, right? And so as we work into nutrition, you realize it's all linked and all linked with brain function. Now, we want to finish off with cardiorespiratory for this masterclass. Like, what kind of cardio am I going to have you do? <coughs> Excuse me. What kind of cardio is going to vary depending on your stress, right? So the last thing you need, when I was going through my massive adrenal fatigue, I was really trying to limit how much cortisol I put out because I was really at a point where I was so high cortisol, I had trouble sleeping. And so one thing that cardiorespiratory, true cardiorespiratory does is put off a lot of cortisol. Now, while weight training does put off a little cortisol, it also helps increase the spike in your positive androgen. So for females, um, estrogen, testosterone balance. For males, testosterone. It gets that boost for both males and females. And so it's definitely worth the investment. Now, running distance, if you're a distance athlete and you love to do um, long races, we'll probably adjust it based on what your current endocrinology is. And we can establish that by sleep patterns and how you're feeling. But in general, if you are extremely stressed, I'll probably start you with walking. But the only caveat here is play. And this is where we work in something very, very unique. The happiest people, if you read The Rise of Superman, the happiest people tend to people tend to be people that are in flow state. And people that are in flow state are people that are act actively integrating into activities that they lose their minds in, not like crazy, but they can lose themselves in. So for me, I speak personally, when I am grappling, when I am wrestling, when I'm training jujitsu, time stands still. I'm focused completely on the activity at hand and I am connecting these beautiful movement patterns, hopefully, <laughs> and really connecting and losing myself in. And as I do that, my endocrinology is completely different where if I go for a 10 mile run. Now, if you happen to be a runner, there will be some greater questions that I, that I ask before I decide whether we need to use that as your flow state activity. But this is where play becomes important. Going to kick a ball, going to dribble a basketball, going to play a game, um, going to surf, going to rock climb, going to for a hike. It is mentally and physically engaging. And so because of that, your stress hormone changes, right? And how your mind is working changes. And so I encourage you to find that play theory. Find what works for you that you can start playing into. Now, if your strength and conditioning is not at a point where you can go like, oh, well, you know, Victor, I used to drop into a bowl and skate. I don't want you to do that week one, but you potentially could go play around on a skateboard. Or if basketball was your sport, you can't just go out there and play full court basketball if your conditioning is not there. However, going out and exploring, dribbling the ball, shooting it, consistently moving for 15 minutes, not only will get you that beautiful movement activity, because I always believe movement is medicine, exercise is medicine, it'll move things around, not only will it give you that, but it'll also have a positive impact on your endocrinology and your mindset. So I hope this helps you. I regurgitated a ton of information into what my program is involved. And there's likely going to be more questions that you have, but you can directly reach out to me directly if you've already started your program and ask those questions. But hopefully that gives you a little 30,000 foot view looking down into like, oh, this is what we're working on. And every single person at every level of my program sees great success if they understand this and stick to the program. Try not to let anything out, leave anything out of it because there's likely it's gonna come back and get you. And a lot of people see success initially by jumping hardcore into what they believe is in a complete program, which is you know a high intensity interval, 
good weight training, tons of cardio, and starve yourself. We don't want to starve yourself, for example. What we want to do is achieve ultimate health. When we achieve ultimate health, the weight just starts falling off. And I have found this consistently through personal experience with my, with my clients. I used to think personally, I would have people journal and I go, well, you're lying to me because you haven't lost weight. But then I started evaluating stress and endocrinology a little deeper and I realized like, oh, this person is unwell. That's why when they go into this very restrictive diet, nothing's happening because they're so essentially in dis-ease or sick that their body doesn't want and wants to hold on to this. Um, and we, we will get in other videos deeper down the rabbit hole to describe specific parts of all of these uh, all of these elements but for right now I look forward to working with you let's get let's achieve that health and wellness and that happiness all in one